Oh, okay. Well, that'll be a little drop. Oh, it will? Oh, well, well, I don't know now. There'll be a little bit of talk. reconciliation and support for the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the legislative voice, we give thanks for the opportunity to live among First Nations people. We acknowledge that we gather on the land of the Ghana people, whose spiritual sovereignty flows through the generations. We pay our respects to their elders, who were and who are for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of the Ghana people today. And a little bit of housekeeping. Don't be embarrassed if you're wearing a mask. COVID and uh, various other ailments are uh, out and about. Uh, so uh, uh, if you've uh, taken your mask off and you will really feel more comfortable with it on, um, go for it. This venue, as I think I've said before, is a no smoking, responsible drinking venue. Um, <laughs> and uh, someone just said it's too late. Um, <laughs> toilets are out front near the doors where you came in and there's another toilet down the hallway um, past that exit sign. Should there be an emergency, um, then uh, we'll exit, depending upon where the emergency might be happening, either out through the front doors or out through the side doors. We know exactly how many people are here tonight, um, so we'll uh, have no difficulty making sure that we've got everyone covered. We, we have a uh, wonderful program tonight, and uh, the good news is that I don't need to be jumping up and down uh, every time uh, something is going to happen uh, because uh, I have and I'm very confident that this will run like clockwork. So again, welcome everyone to the Effective Living Centre at Christchurch and this year's observation. A couple of special people to mention. Firstly, we have uh, the only mayor, Michael Hewitson and wife Rosalind, welcome again and uh, uh, for what uh, seems to be almost like an annual catch-up. <coughs> Matthew Ives, Matthew I saw come in with his uh, hat on, uh, that's, oh he's taking his hat off now, I can't find him. <laughs> um, Cultural Development Officer at Munley Council, welcome. Family and friends of our orator this year, um, Katrina Sedgwick, from interstate and uh, from Adelaide, welcome to you. Friends from the Adelaide Arts Community and to all friends and supporters of ELC and Christchurch, um, welcome. Now I'd like to ask um, Julie to uh, pick up from here and uh, welcome Julie. I'm Julie Redman. I was the first chair of the Effective Living Centre, which started 25 years ago. So 25 years ago in 1998, a small group of five of us met over lunch with a vision of seeking a greater dialogue between the secular and the sacred. Three of us were active members of this progressive uh, theology arm of the United Church, and two were lapsed Christians being completely disillusioned with the institutional church. And one of these was Graham Wilkes, who was earnestly seeking dialogue with others of the many threads of thought and experience
expression that he had, to weave a truly life-giving experience and to share community with others. So following this, we created the Effective Living Centre with uh, the Christchurch uh, uh, being very much the integral part of the founding of the Effective Living Centre. And Graham became the founding secretary of the centre and assisted in setting its vision and its objectives. He was a man of many talents, a former Presbyterian minister, a social worker, counsellor, and latterly the CEO of Relationships Australia. He gathered together a broad life experience to share great vision, wisdom, and insight. He accepted the position of the founding secretary despite having suffered a debilitating stroke leaving him needing to regain his speech and his ability to write. Little did we know what a challenge we had offered him in suggesting him as secretary. A man with a passion to pursue a vision, no matter the physical and mental challenges presented. <coughs> Graham was incredibly creative and the importance of creativity in the arts to provide a part of a full and rich life was never far from his thoughts. Graham shared an eclectic approach to life that drew many threads of thought and expression to achieve a truly fulfilled life. His philosophy of life, simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before, and we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. We need to strive for a just and open society, authenticity and truth, psychological and spiritual health, a purposeful striving for a loving, inclusive community. After three years of sharing his wisdom, Graham Wilkes passed away, having enriched all around him. And we're very pleased to continue the Wilkes Oration uh, to remember this inspirational man and the ongoing inspiration that the Effective Living Centre has given to us all. Thank you, Julie. And I'd now like to ask Claire, Claire Garrett, one of the great friends of ELC, um, to to us a song or two. Claire's been carefully looking after her guitar over there away from the air conditioning units. I have no idea why, but Claire said that no, no, it throws the guitar out of tune. And I said it does the same to my singing as well. <laughs> Welcome, Claire. <laughs>
I did have trouble keeping in tune. <laughs> it's now uh, time to formally introduce our orator. And to do that, I'd like to ask one of the ELC management committee members, uh, Margaret Calder, to come and uh, do our introduction. Thank you. all at the ELC. We're pleased to have you here to join with us. And it's an honour tonight particularly to welcome and it's a real delight to welcome Katrina as our orator. Katrina grew up here in Adelaide where at nine she acted in the Peter Weir film The Last Wave. Along with the Along with the starring actor Katrina was uh, David Gopu and uh, Richard Chamberlain. And since then, since meeting David Gopu, Katrina developed a real interest in Indigenous issues. And tonight she has asked for the honorarium that we give to our speaker to be given to the Indigenous Literary Foundation. went to Witcham uh, Primary School and it was at Witcham where she actually interviewed the Peter Weir film. And I went up to see the um, filming one night, one of the segments. And it was fascinating to see Katrina acting in front of the lights. It was night time. And it was, act it was really interesting for me to see the filming process because I was never familiar with that, especially the huge wind fans that they had because in the film it was a stormy night where it was as, as calm as anything outside but they had these huge fans. And those sorts of things stay with you. 
Katrina went on from Mitcham to Marriottville High School, which is known for its arts and its music, and her focus on the arts developed from that time and further on as she went on. She continued to develop her interest in the arts and she joined the State Opera. In 1995, she became the co-founder of the Sydney Fringe Festival. But coming back to Adelaide in 1996, she was the special events producer for the Adelaide Festival of Arts directed the children's festival, Come Out. That's still going. They've changed its name this year and I wondered why, but they did change its name. But I remembered Katrina started it off in 1999. She thought then she might move into state, but she was asked by the Premier, the then Premier Mike Gran, to stay and direct the inaugural biennial Adelaide International Film Festival. And she was in this role for five years. She encouraged South Australia to invest in feature films like Samson and Delilah, Ten Canoes, Home Stories. They're still available, available for you to see. They did go on to have international success. In 2012, Katrina became head of arts in the ABC where she commissioned a diverse range of products, proj um, projects sorry, for prime time television. Things like Hannah Gadsby Oz, The Real Mary Poppins, Art and Soul 2, and documentaries such as Brilliant Creatures and Tender. She also chaired the ABC Council and Richard Finlayson, the ABC's director of TV, said it was Katrina who established an ABC arts band with content across television, radio, news and online. She continued to invest in TV series and some of the series that were on at that time you might know, uh, The Book Club with Jennifer Byrne, At The Movies with Margaret Pomeranz and uh, David Stratton. From then she moved in 2015 to become CEO and director of the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. And this is in Melbourne, and it's had wonderful exhibitions on film, TV, games, digital culture and art. In 2020, Katrina was awarded a medal of the Order of Australia for her work in the arts. Earlier this year, 2023, she became the inaugural director and CEO of the Melbourne Arts Precinct, where she now manages a $1.7 billion transformation of a single continuous art, civic and cultural precinct, which will stretch from the square in Swanson Street through South Bank. So it's something you should go and see when you are next in Melbourne. So you can see from this, Katrina is very well qualified to speak to us tonight about the arts, the essential fabric of our society. So please join me in welcoming Katrina Sedgwick. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margie. Um, so I would like to start by acknowledging that um, in this place and on this land that we live in the extraordinary heritage uh, that First Nations people have created and preserved uh, continuously for over 60,000 years. Um, and acknowledge that we're here today on the unceded land of the Ghana people and pay my respects to elders past and present. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'll just get my slides working. 
There we are. Linda Burney, Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians, says in the foreword to the recently launched Revive, the National Cultural Policy, for First Nations peoples, culture is more than just visual and performing arts. It includes language, song lines, stories, sacred sites and traditional knowledge. Culture is the sum of all things, the essence of our being. Connection to culture is integral for the health and well-being of First Nations peoples, to our sense of identity and to maintaining the vitality and strength of our communities. Um, and I think that's a really great way to kind of couch what we think about tonight um, when we talk about arts being the fabric of our society. It's so, so crucial in Australia that we acknowledge the specialness of First Nations uh, people's culture and history and connection to this land and the gift that we've all got as multicultural communities living here amongst First Nations people to be a part of that um, 60,000 years. Um, I would like to thank Margie um, for your introduction and also for inviting uh, me here tonight um, and also to thank uh, Ian uh, Calder and Jonathan and Janine Barker as well for roping me in. Um, I'm following in the steps of many illustrious people who've given the Wilkes oration uh, before me and I really hope that I can honour Graham's memory here with this speech tonight. So I'll begin. Arts are the essential fabric of our society. And what do we mean by the arts? Well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's the use of imagination to express ideas or feelings. Arts are about imagination, creativity, storytelling, identity, expression, collaboration, empowerment, communication, exchange, challenge, all of these things that make us human. Arts are culture. Every society and community of humans has expressed themselves and their imagination through the arts, every faith, through storytelling and literature, painting and music, dance and sculpture, architecture and fashion, through ritual and craft, through oral traditions and physical forms and now digital platforms. And we've created tools for this expression, musical instruments and paper and printing presses, canvases and brushes, astonishing buildings, fabulous fabrics, lights, cameras, projection and digital technology, constantly innovating and expressing. Uh, the magnificent theremin is a beautiful example of the kind of innovation human beings have evolved. Artists have reinvented form over and over again. They've taken technologies and adapted and appropriated them to tell the stories and express the ideas that our society urgently and passionately wants to explore through these transformative, inspiring, challenging, joyful, entertaining, terrifying or awe-inspiring works that reflect back to us who we are. Um, I asked ChatGPT to write 50 words on the arts. Uh, I said, the arts are the essential fabric of our society. ChatGPT, give me 50 words. It took less than five seconds. Um, and you can see them here. The arts form the essential fabric of our society, weaving together the diverse threads of culture, expression, and human experience. They ignite imagination, challenge perceptions, and foster empathy. Through music, literature, visual arts, and more, the arts enrich our lives, stimulate dialogue, and inspire progress, making them truly indispensable. Which is surprisingly not too bad, <laughs> one has to say. Um, for those not already across it, and it's the first time that I've used ChatGPT, it gets its information through a thing called web scraping. Um, it amalgamates text data from online books and articles and websites and so on and brings them together into a kind of collected, generalised interpretation. And so that's how AI expresses the arts and its role. And I do understand why actors and writers are striking right now in Hollywood against the spectre of AI taking over. Um, of course, it is pretty jargony, and I probably will be too during this, uh, during this speech. Um, it also does go pretty immediately to a traditional definition of the arts, that is music and literature and visual arts. When asked about how they define the arts, particularly those raised in largely Western traditions, the arts are often defined as traditional elite art forms, opera, ballet, symphony orchestras, text-based theatre, 
painting and sculpture. And indeed, our funding structures do still disproportionately invest in these forms. And those who access these more traditional forms reflect only a small part of our society, and that audience is generally white and middle class. Look around this evening. But art and culture has a far broader definition, of course, and millions of us across our nation engage with arts and culture every day. Revive which is the new federal arts and cultural policy launched in April, is contextualised in part by a wonderful introductory essay by author Christos Solkis and historian Claire Wright. Both of them were on the Federal Advisory Committee as the policy was developed, and I encourage you to go and have a look at their introduction um, to read it in full. But they say in part, culture then is the sum of our stories and our music, of our paintings and our craft, our films and our games, our songs and our dance, our architecture and design, as well as the history of our wars and conflicts, our arguments and accords. It's a story of our comings and our goings, our migrations. Culture is also constantly being created and re-energised in the here and now. It's how we play together, entertain each other, inform, enrage and engage with each other. Culture is never the story of us. Culture is dynamic, Culture is a force. Art and culture enrich and reflect and respond to our lives, and they are indispensable. But strategic, bold, and consistent government policy and then targeted application of subsidy and programs are crucial to ensure that artists and artistic practice are fostered across our community, not just in the leafy inner city suburbs, and that equitable access to and engagement with the arts is equally prioritised. The benefits of this are measurable and rich and crucial in this rapidly evolving world that we inhabit. It's our government and our cultural institutions' responsibility, local, state and federal, to develop and deliver policy and through this investment to foster and nurture artistic practice, presentation, <coughs> engagement and education and ensure people right across our community are able to access and participate in, explore and express themselves through the arts, regardless of their geographic or socioeconomic or cultural background <coughs> or identity. When the pandemic hit in Melbourne on March the 23rd, 2020, we all left our offices and we set up at home. Schools were closed, a curfew and a limit of, five, of a five kilometre radius was established in which we could walk the suburban streets. We thought it would last a couple of weeks, a month maybe. And two years later, we'd spent over 200 days confined in our homes, on and off, sometimes for a few days, sometimes for months. For the arts, it was catastrophic, as liveness, being together within a crowd became impossible, and people across the industry had their livelihoods instantly removed. And a wave of collective yearning surged as we realised how much the arts and that collective experience meant in our lives. Thank goodness for digital technology and screens and artistic ingenuity. Artists, poets, musicians, writers and museums and galleries and concert halls and so many more began to deliver, the, deliver their work online and audiences flocked to it. Suddenly it looked like digital platforms could generate revenue for practitioners wherever they, where they never could before. For my two teenage boys, Zoom enabled their schooling to continue and chat platforms like Discord enabled them to talk with their friends but it was through the incredibly creative platform of video games and the astonishing worlds created on those online massive multiplayer spaces where they hung out and played and worked as teams and problem solved and adventured with their friends over those strange, isolating months. And many of these platforms remain. We all talk about games and what series we're streaming on TV. But as soon as restrictions lifted, often with an appropriate level of caution, everyone also went back to liveness, visiting theatres and festivals and concerts and exhibitions. Because, of course, it's not just the work itself. It's sharing that work with others, loved ones, strangers, sharing stories and experiences and ideas and curiosity. Growing up here in Adelaide in the 1970s and 80s, here on Ghana land, it was a golden time. Federally, it was a time of bold policy and unprecedented investment in the arts. 
Gough Whitlam's government quickly established the Australia Council, the National Gallery, Triple J, and invested in the Australian film and TV industry and more. And meanwhile, the arts were absolutely central to the Premier of South Australia's strategy for the state. Don Dunstan had a vision that placed the arts and culture and ideas, conversations and conviviality at the centre of his government's agenda, building on this city's deep passion for the arts. He was a bold reformer with equity, access, inclusion and justice, fundamental values. As the Don Dunstan Foundation states, Many of his reforms in sex discrimination, Aboriginal land rights and consumer protection were the first of their kind in Australia. He was a leading campaigner for immigration reform, was instrumental in the, in the elimination of the white Australia policy. He was instrumental in social welfare and child protection reforms, consumer protection, Aboriginal land rights, urban planning, heritage protection, anti-discrimination laws, abolition of capital punishment, environmental protection and censorship. This is by Nigel Murray Harvey. It's called Captain Adelaide. In arts and culture too, his policies were groundbreaking. He not only created Australia's first state film agency, the South Australian Film Corporation, the first performing arts centre, the Adelaide Festival Centre, and a youth performing arts centre in Karkloo, the first government funded festival and a festival fringe in the country, the first and only state youth arts festival, but also supported the restaurant scene and food and wine industries, even writing his own cookbook. And with this holistic policy focus, our identity as a state and our economy, economy shifted as a result. A festival is exciting because it creates a moment of critical mass that invites a broad audience to explore, to be curious, to try things that they might not otherwise see. And it really works when it delivers a balanced program. That is, one that offers audiences multiple points of entry, programming work that spans the spectrum, from glossy and broad appeal attracting large audiences to the experimental and niche, even for just one person at a time. I love it that festivals enable access and remove barriers, distance, cost, invitation, for audiences to be able to see a broad range of work and hear from voices across their community and Australia and the world. I also understand that a mass audience is really a series of smaller audiences and communities who can gain value from this approach. That is, it doesn't all have to appeal to lots of people all the time, just some of the time. The first arts festival in Australia, the Adelaide Festival of Arts, was born out of a lively local culture of theatre and music and catalyzed into existence by its community, led by John Bishop in 1960. The Dunstan government began funding the Arts Festival and its fringe in the 1970s, and then expanded the vision of Festival Hall into the Adelaide Festival Centre. By the time I was in high school, the festivals in Adelaide in March were recognised the world over. They were proudly owned by the whole city, and had become part of the identity of Adelaide in the state, part of our DNA. Even the number plates in our cars proclaimed, we were the festival state. Later, I was a producer on Fed Square, the club for Barry Kosky's 96 festival, and then special events producer on Robin's 98 and 2000 festivals. We worked with a wide range of community and cultural organisations across the state. Not once did I get a no when I asked many thousands of people to get involved. This collective community ownership of this element of the state's heritage was powerful, and it shaped investment and policy in the state from then on. The festivals in Adelaide grew out of the community, but then the government literally built on this momentum with bold and visionary investment that took the festival in the state to another level and a rich heritage was born for South Australia, both in physical infrastructure and cultural activity and for our economy. In 2008, I was one of the thousand Australians invited to be part of Kevin Rudd's 2020 summit in Canberra as part of the Creative Australia stream. Over the two days of highly structured discussion, we broke into cross-disciplinary groups to explore what were the urgent policy levers to be pulled, first to support arts and arts engagement in Australia. Overwhelmingly, in every group, the number one priority was the crucial role of arts in education. Arts in education is not just about giving children the confidence to express themselves through arts practice, and for some to become artists 
as adults, but for young people to feel invited in, to not be excluded by perceived barriers to elite forms, but to engage and be enriched by artistic practice across its forms and platforms. And it's also about fostering their innate creativity and imagination to problem solve laterally and to work collaboratively. Is my sound going funny? It is. Put it up. Is that a bit better? Yeah, sorry about that. I can hear myself ringing. Um, as the economy of the developed world turns increasingly away from hard industries and jobs in manufacturing and many service industries vanish, the robots are coming. Governments and corporations and po policy makers recognise that the so-called soft skills, those that we learn in the arts and humanities, intuition, imagination, creativity, communication, will be vital to drive our future. Alongside the importance of teaching the arts in schools and of artists in schools programs, a model like the Come Out Festival is remarkable. It was established by Dunstan in 1971. It's now moved, morphed into the Dream Big Festival under the excellent Susanna Sweeney's leadership. It was and remains a unique model in Australia because it's funded jointly by arts and the education departments. It's a biennial festival that genuinely touched every school across the state. It fostered an ownership of the arts through their festivals by children and sat alongside significant investment into rich school in arts programs, car clue, youth theatres, specialist music schools, the State Youth Opera Company. I joke that Adelaide arts people of my generation are like a virus spreading across the nation and the world. So many South Australians play key roles in the arts. And I think it's from this particular time and focus of government policy and a community that embraced it that helped us all to build careers right across this industry. As a child, I wanted passionately to be a performer. And I had many opportunities to explore this as I grew up. Thanks in large to my incredible mum, Pauline, and to the government schools in leafy inner suburbs that had rich music and drama programs. When I finished school, I got into uni to do an arts degree. I took a gap year thinking that I'd get a job in the public service, but mum persuaded me to audition for Magic Circus with Wayne Anthony, and instead I became a clown, and I've never looked back. Um, I can't thank my mother enough for encouraging me to not take the conventional path, because two years later, I joined multidisciplinary theatre company, founded here in Adelaide, but then based in Sydney. It was called Etc., led by Julia Cotton and Russell Garbutt. And this is a picture of us performing at the 86 Adelaide Festival, appropriately here standing on the columns out the front of Parliament House. Etc. was a collective of artists with different skills. Julia was a choreographer trained at the Australian Ballet. Ian Farr was a brilliant composer. John Nelson, a painter. Russell Garbutt, an actor and a comic who was also a very skilled illusionist. I know how to levitate people. I know how to cut off their heads and have their heads transport across the stage. I've got all sorts of tricks. Um, Etc. was my university. We developed, wrote and produced our own shows collaboratively on project funding. We had to be highly resourceful, stretching a small budget to create a show and then make sure it would tour for as many iterations as possible. We performed in festivals around Australia and the world, in theatre and making street theatre. You see us here as the businessmen, which we developed in 1986 and I think they kept going for another decade. I was 18 when I joined, and working with these marvellous people in their 30s and their 40s, and I learned so many skills that shaped my career ever since. The value of cross-disciplinary collaboration and experimentation and iteration. Go for it, try things out. If it's not perfect, do it better the next time. Be resourceful, find ways of stretching budgets. How do you work with a group of people with different skills and expertise? How do you market things? How do you tour things? How do you pitch an idea? How do you say yes rather than no? And how do you feel comfortable when not everything works perfectly but learn from it all? So all of those skills were very handy when in my mid-twenties I realised I wasn't going to be the next Kate Blanchett and after a couple of years of feeling pretty sad about it all I decided that festivals might be the things for me, which obviously meant I came back to Adelaide, the home of festivals in Australia. I wrote to Ian Scobie, said, can I volunteer? He gave me a six-week job and I was here working in festivals for the next 15 years. <laughs> festivals in South Australia are community events. They bring people together, empowering them. Robin Archer is a superb festival director. 
not only programming wonderful work, but she's fantastic in the way that she engages communities and new audiences. In 2000, Robin secured half a million dollars from the Australia Council to deliver the only significant regional program the festival has ever delivered. We put it in places across this state so that no one had to drive more than two hours to attend an event, which is quite remarkable. Plenty by Gay Bilson was a site-specific event with local produce turned into a generous meal for our audiences as festival artists performed, attracting thousands to Beachport, Sejuna, Penishore and Burra. Yol Nuban, Narbalek, toured to the APY lands, bringing 500 Aboriginal people from right across the lands to this free concert under the moonlight. Theatre Cantanka did their kooky show, The Eye, in Keith and Renmark. Despite the festival being city-centric, it was passionately loved by all South Australians who came out in droves. And it's a great shame that no meaningful regional program has ever been invested in since, because of the incredible access that that program provided, that rewarded the ownership and pride already felt across the state. As Prime Minister Anthony Albanese launched the new cultural policy revive in April of this year, he said, arts are meant to be at the heart of our life. And this is a really important moment because the last Prime Minister who acknowledged the importance of the arts in Australian life was Paul Keating 30 years ago. Revive places First Nations people at the centre of the policy and commits that First Nation programs will be led by First Nations people. It also acknowledges the crucial role of arts and education, including specialist in-school arts education programs. I'm quoting Christos Solkis and Claire Wright again. The entitlement of all Australians to have access to culture, a liberty, by the way, enshrined in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which Australia is a signatory, is a theme that runs throughout this policy and one which was core to the submissions received. This requires we think seriously about the pathways to becoming artists and cultural producers. It demands a rethinking of our education system and of the skills and training opportunities for young Australians. The way to challenge elitism is to democratise the creative industries and the cultural in institutions themselves. The Australia Council's 2020 research, Creating Our Future, results of the National Arts Participation Survey found that experiencing arts and culture is not a pastime of the elite. 98% of Australians already are engaging in many ways. But they also found that many have tended to think of cultural investment only as support for artists, rather than as a vital investment into the well-being and prosperity of our whole community. The research also notes that inequalities remain in the ways Australians attend cultural events, including in relation to income and disability. It states that cultural inc inclusion is vital to the health, well-being and prosperity of Australian <coughs> communities and for generations to come because the emotional, mental and social benefits of arts experience are countless and well documented, from increased understanding of each other, stronger critical thinking skills, mental well-being, decreased stress levels, to significant public benefits such as social... Cons these places often presented a daunting edifice a barrier to people who did not feel comfortable in these spaces and by extension in the art world. These perceived barriers meant that many people never set foot inside them, even though, they were, even though that they were intended for them. Over the past few dec decades, a shift has been occurring. Many of these cultural institutions are reframing their purpose, understanding their civic role as a gathering place, a safe place, where people from right across the community can explore and discover diverse perspectives and arts and ideas, their past and present heritage, and then talk about these experiences. The institutions within these buildings are opening up, refocusing their resources to share a more diverse range of perspectives and work, to invite in diverse audiences and to target groups who they acknowledge have been discouraged in the past. Many of the most popular and inspiring museums are now reinventing themselves in radical ways. I loved to visit the Art Gallery of South Australia in recent years with my late father, Tony. This is a photo again for the 1986 festival with etc. dancing in front of the gallery. After being taken there often with my mum growing up, I'd grown tired of its fusty colonial hang. But in recent years, under the, under the leadership of Nick Mitsevich and now the brilliant Rana Davenport, uh, AXA, I think, is one of the most thrilling galleries anywhere. I love the reimagining of the 
collection and those traditional halls. You go right through the front door to explore the juxtaposition of First Nations artworks against the colonial works created in parallel. And then the chronology messed with placing contemporary work against old, the breadth of form, painting and furniture, textiles and film and sculpture. Go left into the international rooms where the contemporary illuminates centuries old artworks and vice versa. Across the gallery, diverse voices are loud and proud. Under Nikki Cumston's leadership, Tanandi is now a hugely anticipated event across the nation. The youth, of it, youth events AGSA runs are hugely popular, again, changing the face of the gallery audience now and into the future. And the Frida Kahlo show is incredible if you haven't been to see it yet. Shared cultural spaces, places to gather together to explore ideas and then talk about them, have become more vital in our society than ever. If we really care about equality, inclusion and diversity, subsidised institutions that don't compete on commercial terms can challenge the dominant narrative in entertaining and illuminating ways, fostering social cohesion and enabling connection. I moved to Melbourne in 2015 to take up the role of uh, Director and CEO of ACME, our National Museum of Screen Culture. And it was a great time to arrive in Melbourne from an arts policy perspective. I've disappeared. Ah, here we are. The Andrews government had just been elected and Martin Foley had been named arts, arts Minister. And one of the first things he did was rename Arts Victoria to Creative Victoria. I think the move to expand the arts polio, portfolio to creative industries is something that's quite important. I don't think it diminishes the role of artists, but it does acknowledge the broader, non-traditional notion of what creativity is. And it also breaks down the cliches around creative practice. So alongside dance, music, literature, visual arts, it's architecture, fashion, screen, broadcasting games, design and technology. It's often been really hard to argue the value of arts into government. They're not interested in the argument of arts for art's sake. So how do we measure the quantitative as well as the qualitative benefits when we're seeking investment of taxpayer dollars? Creative Victoria commissioned Boston Consulting Group to study the impact on the Victorian creative and cultural economy through the lens of both economic value and the broader societal benefits it brings to Victoria. Um, consult, cons, cons, um, consultants are getting a bit of battering at the moment and uh, probably uh, entirely fairly. Um, but this really was a very, very useful piece um, of consultation. So it found that in 2013, the uh, sector, the creative industry sector, generated $22 billion um, in the Victorian economy. It employed 222,000 people, and it accounted for 8% of the state economy, which is larger than the manufacturing sector. Um, that turns it into a pretty powerful argument for portfolios right across government. So therefore, all of the ministers started supporting the idea of a creative state strategy, which um, was developed through consultation with about 10,000 people um, over a year-long process. Um, and when it was finally passed, it came with $115 million funding. Um, it lasted four years. It had a whole series of really kind of clear actions and goals, all of which were delivered, and then in 2020, a second four-year strategy uh, was launched, and they're just starting to uh, develop the next one. Um, it was really important. It talked about the multiple benefits across a range of portfolio areas that a cohesive and properly resourced strategy can bring. The policy placed First Nations first, and it had equity of access at its very, very core, and it really formed um, a, a kind of great inspiration for the national cultural policy that came uh, a few years later. Much of my life in the arts has been working with the screen. Um, as a performer in multidisciplinary theatre and in television, to working on film festivals, um, to commissioning work, to being at the ABC and then my role at ACME. Film and TV is really interesting because it's defined as an industry rather than arts but it is a platform and tool for enormously creative practitioners, for artists who tell stories that can have huge impact and reach. But again, government policy interventions are absolutely crucial. Brian Brown was speaking last week at the National Press Club, and he was talking about the importance of regulation, for example, of the streaming giants to ensure that we still have Australian content. He says, I mean Australian stories, 
not stories filmed in Australia with American accents. That's a cultural death. <coughs> the uh, Indigenous unit in Screen Australia is a shining example of the benefits and impact that a visionary policy and government investment can make. Excuse me. <coughs> so the Indigenous unit's been operating for about 26 years and it's identified talented individuals and invested in those individuals over years in developing their filmmaking skills. And it's literally changed the face of our industry and the way that audiences nationally and globally engage with First Nations storytelling. Warwick Thornton was the first of their alumni to make a feature film, which was Samson and Delilah, that I'm sure you all have seen. Penny Smallercombe, who was the former head of Indigenous, said at their 25th anniversary um, celebration in 2018, SBS, NITV, the ABC, AFTAS, and Indigenous organisations like Karma have all been on this incredible journey. And together, we've gone from a place where we were absent from screens, or stories were told about us, to being able to tell our own stories. Our faces are now routinely seen on television. Our languages are heard at the cinema. Our stories are now shared online with people around the world. Our work is celebrated at international festivals, treasured at home, and have become a cultural and commercial resource for our people. At the Adelaide Film Festival, where I was founding director for a decade, we were granted an investment fund by the Bren Premier, Mike Grant, and it was quite radical, this money. It was a million dollars every two years. It only came with a couple of caveats. Projects had to return some kind of economic return to South Australia. The works had to ideally world premiere at the Adelaide Film Festival. But the principal selection criteria was the creative potential of the work itself, how it can speak to an audience in the festival environment and beyond, the calibre of the artists involved, the championing of that voice, the quality of the idea. It was an incredibly liberating pool of money. It enabled us to make bold choices and demonstrated the benefit that film industry investment based principally on qualitative selection criteria could bring. And lo and behold, it was hugely successful. We supported many first-time filmmakers' films, Samson and Delilah, Sarah Watts' Look Both Ways, Justin Cazell's Snowtown, and all three of Anthony Maris's short film, who went on to make um, Hotel Mumbai. Fictional and factual films, animations, shorts, um, cross-platform works. And we supported grand experiments, sometimes with real success. Many of the films went on to international success at Cannes, Toronto, Venice and Berlin, and garnered prestigious awards. This fund gave practitioners a rare opportunity to experiment and take risks. Government funding opportunities in the screen are shrinking and it really is vital that agencies are given the backing to establish these kinds of programs that support this experimenting and new forms and new models and that they can consistently bank talent over time, diverse talent, and invest longer term in their careers. It works for the Institute of Sport and it can work in the arts and cultural sectors. When I was programming arts and film festivals, I loved the opportunity to create a moment of critical mass to invite in a broad audience to explore and discover things that they might not see. By applying the government subsidy that we had in festivals, we enabled access and removed barriers. And we enabled audiences to see a broad range of work and hear from voices across Australia and the globe. Public broadcasting needs to do the same thing. Through the public broadcasters, audiences can access arts programming and perhaps discover something that might encourage them to go and see a new Australian theatre work or visit a gallery or engage with the artists who are reflecting our society and stories back to them or inspire them to even create something themselves. The importance of this, the removing of barriers to access uh, through public broadcast, be it on radio or online or on television, is perhaps why the ABC Charter particularly states that the broadcaster exists in part to promote the arts. In the three years I was head of arts for ABC TV, the one thing I really struggled with was the different interpretations the leadership team had around the measures of reach and impact. Quantitative measures, ratings, are important. ABC TV Arts had to ensure across a balanced program that some of its investment delivered prime time high rating programs. And they were the easy commissioning conversations. It was much harder to argue 
that a program should be commissioned or acquired when it was clear that the ratings would be relatively small, for example, a one-off half hour, or even more challengingly, commissioning a feature or a documentary that showcased, for example, an artist and their practice. Australian practitioners, some of our leading theatre and dance companies, musicians, visual artists, opera companies, they might perform or exhibit for up to a few thousand people each year. Most Australians will have never had the opportunity or even have had the inclination to seek them out and see their work live. It's really vital we showcase the creative processes and work of these practitioners. And equally important, we support the filmmakers who have a passion to creatively tell these practitioners' stories. But that's not all arts should be doing on the ABC. Channel 4 in the UK charted a very clear path in its approach to its distinctive and high impact arts programming. They say that Channel 4 tries to do the reverse of what most other channels do in this area. We don't make programs about artists, we commission artists to make programs about us. In other words, we ask artists to author the films that we screen. Alumni from this approach to programming which was supported by Arts Council England, included visual artist, now Academy Award-winning filmmaker Steve McQueen, most notably uh, for his work 12 Years a Slave, and Turner Award-winning ceramicist Grayson Perry, who's now a regular on the BBC screens. We began a not dissimilar intervention here in 2007 with the Hive Production Fund, which was an $800,000 biennial fund um, with match funding from Adelaide Film Festival, ABC TV Arts, the Australia Council and Screen Australia. And it's the first and only time all of those institutions have worked together. It invited practitioners from across the arts into the world of film and TV. And it created a whole series of works that had no other path to funding. Stephen Page adapted his full-length dance piece, Spear, with Bangara into a feature film. Rosemary Myers from Winnemore Performing Arts adapted her production for young people, Girl Asleep, into a feature film went on to premiere at Berlin Film Festival and they have a, now a permanent screen production arm in that performing arts company. Over a dozen films were made, screened on the ABC. The innovation here was that these practitioners, who often are leading their field in Australia, were able to contemplate film or TV as a medium for their storytelling into the future and the barriers between these silos were shown to be at least partly porous. One of the most successful of the Hive projects was a half-hour comedy drama created by Back to Back Theatre. Back to Back is led by artistic director Bruce Gladwin, with an ensemble of hugely talented performers and creators with a perceived disability. Based in Geelong, they're one of Australia's most successful theatre companies. And last year, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Theatre, the Henrik Ibsen Award by the Norwegian government. And I should declare at the moment, uh, I am the chair of their board, so somewhat biased. <laughs> um, they made this half-hour sci-fi comedy called Oddlands. It was devised, written by, and performed by the ensemble of performers with uh, largely intellectual disabilities, in collaboration with Bruce Gladwin, who directed and wrote it. In any year, they might perform to two to 3,000 people. The live-to-air ABC broadcast that screened uh, attracted 140,000 viewers. I mean, it's just incredible, the reach and impact, and yet, if you just look at it in purely rating terms, it was a failure, but of course it's not a failure, it's a phenomenal success. Um, since then, they've made a feature film adaptation of one of their theatre shows entitled Shadow, and it's having a theatrical release right now in Australia. It's already won accolades and prizes all around the world. They've also got an animated series of short films screening on ABC Me that they've made with school kids. They've run a paid internship program, which sees a person with a disability working alongside every key crew role as they make their feature films. And they're developing their next feature film already with their, through their now permanent screen arm. This has to be seen as a success by any measure. This is about changing the conversation. It's about empowering this company whose ensemble members are extraordinary artists who happen to have a disability, to have a powerful voice on our public television screens. And they are, like they do in theatre, creating distinctive, important, entertaining and engaging film and TV. The ABC can give leading creative practitioners the opportunity to tell their stories on this canvas, but it takes a different kind of commissioning process. The ABC is going through its second major restructure in eight years, after years of devastating cuts to its budget by the former federal government. There is so much wonderful opportunity to foster and innovate 
and share the arts. But without a dedicated head of arts at the ABC, it cannot meet its charter requirements. It needs a serious commissioning budget in partnership with state and federal arts and screening funding agencies. They need the resources to commission bold and engaging arts content on television, radio and online by screen and arts uh, practitioners right across the nation. In an article in The Guardian today, um, there's a story outlining research led by Hilary Glow at Deakin University and it confirms what we all know and is reflected in tonight's audience. For most of Australians' arts and cultural organisations, their audience profiles are still stubbornly white, middle class and middle aged. Of the 184 Australian cultural organisations surveyed and 1,011 individual responses from those working within arts organisations, more than half of the respondents conceded they had made little or no changes to their programming or to their outreach programs to attract audiences from different cultures, age groups, geographic locations and gender identities. In general, arts festivals, museums and galleries, opera companies and orchestras appeared the most resistant to identifying new target audiences and adjusting programming to attract them. It's pretty disheartening particularly given that all of those organisations will have statements about the crucial importance of diversity, equity and access throughout their corporate strategies and culturally diverse, with a high proportion of migrant and refugee families. It is socio-economically disadvantaged. Over five years, the education team is working with every teacher and pupil in the school, along with RMIT University, to bring sophisticated media teaching into all curriculum areas. In one year, ACME twice bussed the entire school student population into the city to visit the museum. For many of the students, it was the first time that they had set foot in the city of Melbourne, let alone to be welcomed into a museum. And these students live 25 minutes away by train. Another school visited from the area without our bus subsidy. And on the train on the way in, the eight and nine-year-old students were subjected to racial vilification by two adult male passengers. So the barriers to access are huge. Alongside the pedagogical research opportunities, our goal was to engage with a student cohort and their teachers over a number of years, not only to support their media literacy and learning through the screen, but to see if we could grow an audience by inviting these kids in, and by extension, their families and the broader St Albans Heights community. Alongside this, ACME had committed to a First Nations and a called audience engagement strategy reducing our spend through traditional marketing channels and instead investing money in targeted postcodes that were not where the traditional audience lived, but in the western and outer metropolitan areas, spending in digital channels and publications for communities where English was not their first language. Because these are communities that aren't engaging with traditional mainstream me media channels and advertisement in the age or the advertiser will never reach them, nor a billboard advertisement in Turak or Norwood Digital channels which have been carefully targeted towards capturing traditional audiences for orchestras and theatre and arts festivals um, where they reside are not reaching called or regional or socio-economically disadvantaged communities. There's new audience research technology that you can use that captures anonymous mobile data so that you can capture a mobile, mobile phone ping in Fed Square and it's a bit spooky, it's all anonymous, track where the user's destination starts and where it ends and therefore you can establish the likely postcode where they reside. So using this data, ACME was able to compare our audiences from 2019 to 2021. That is before and after we'd recalibrated where we invested our marketing spend. We found a dramatic change. The top 10 suburbs of visitation to ACME were different and they included regularly outer metropolitan suburbs, including Geelong and Werribee. And another new suburban area started to regularly appear, St Alban Heights. It's all about investment. So, and I'm nearly done. <laughs> Extending from Federation Square through South Bank and beyond, the Melbourne Arts Precinct has one of the highest concentrations of arts, cultural and creative organisations in the world, hosting around 3,000 performances, events and exhibitions each year housed in an array of purpose-built and adapted heritage-listed buildings. And the activity within them, the collections within them, and the social connections to them over time are woven into our culture. 
These connections are complex and they're part of who we are. My current role as Director and CEO of the Melbourne Arts Precinct Corporation um, with our partners is to oversee the construction of Australia's largest ever cultural infrastructure project, the $1.7 billion Melbourne Arts Precinct Transformation. We're building the Fox NGV Contemporary, pictured here at competition stage. It's a stunning new art museum um, designed by Angelo Candelapas. It's going to have over 13,000 square metres of gallery space focused on contemporary art and design. And just to place that in context, that's about the same exhibition space as you'd find in MoMA in New York or the Tate Modern um, in London. So it really enables uh, incredible ambition and opportunity in terms of the contemporary works that this um, gallery is going to be able to show. We're also making major improvements and upgrades to the now 40-year-old Arts Centre Melbourne's iconic theatres building, and in particular, the stunning State Theatre pictured here. And there'll be a range of improvements, including substantial investment in improving accessibility. So people who are struggling with mobility or wheelchair confined will now be able to sit in the centre of the auditorium rather than being confined uh, to the edges. And then wrapping around all of this is an 18,000 square metre urban garden <clears throat> planted for beauty and biodiversity and climate change resilience. It's going to connect these magnificent arts organisations into the broader arts precinct. <coughs> garden goes down and there's the Melbourne Recital Centre there and the um, Melbourne Theatre Company's um, theatre there, the ABC's there and then behind it is Melbourne University, Victorian Arts uh, College and then a whole lot more arts galleries and so on. I mean it's really kind of amazing sort of complex. Thank you. I'm not going to drink it because my hands shake. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I can't deal with holding a glass of water in front of an audience it's too much. Um, Okay, last page. So additionally, we're also um, charged with managing Federation Square, which is Melbourne's town square, the heart of the city and now the gateway to the Melbourne Arts Precinct. This investment by <coughs> the Victorian government is a crucial intervention into the urban fabric of this part of the city. It can enable a truly connected and vibrant arts precinct as a whole, from Federation Square right down Sturt Street. And if we get it right, it's going to be a driver to transform this suburb for residents and businesses alongside the arts organisations. To do this, we've got to ensure that throughout, we're working with our partners across the precinct, the city and the state, holistically, strategically, collaboratively, to ensure it's that the investment's fully leveraged to connect, to enhance, to connect out across the city and the state, and to foster ownership for residents, workers, businesses, visitors, children, to deliver a whole that is larger than the sum of the parts. The project's not only going to bring an additional one million visitors to the precinct annually. I can see the laneways around the area buzzing with cafes and bars, alive with people moving between exhibitions and shows and restaurants, festivals and celebrations taking over the whole area. Metro Rail, which is due to open in 2025, will transport thousands of people to the precinct every day. One of the town hall station stops spills out directly into Fed Square. The Melbourne Arts Precinct will be a living, breathing, creative neighbourhood with diverse and dynamic cultural residents, each with their own role and connected via the commons of the New Arts Avenue. This hugely exciting project over the next few years is going to bring many different people and creative disciplines together, enabling innovation and social interaction in many different ways, building on layers of connection and use for generations of cultural activity in this place. We've got to think holistically connect new and old spaces and stories, practitioners and art, pa art forms right across the precinct and crucially inviting and foster ownership across our community including those who've been traditionally excluded. It's a game-changing moment. It builds on the rich assets handed down from previous generations and it supports a bold contemporary vision. But we must have the principles of access, equity and inclusion at the core of what we do we need to put our money where our mouth is to ensure that this investment generates benefit for our society as a whole. Humans need to share our stories to create art and culture. We need humans 
but we also need subsidy and strategy and policy and real action to enable us all to access and explore and discover and be inspired and be supported to make and share and consume and to be challenged by art and creativity and culture because it is the fabric of our society. And as our society and our world rapidly changes, this fabric, this glue, is more important than ever. Thank you very much. Now, I'm just going to do my best to manage uh, uh, question time. Um, I'm not quite sure that Katrina was um, uh, aware that uh, we were going to add this to the end, but I'm sure we'll manage well. Now, I'm just um, looking for Heather, who has the microphone, um, or was meant to have the microphone. Um, and. Uh, Hello? Hello? Now, I was just going to mention that um, uh, the microphone is on and it works really well when you speak into it and it doesn't work too well when you start to want to say what's going on with Claire's performance. <laughs> Got the idea? Thank you. Um, uh, you. You're correct in saying that um, it's a white middle class audience for many of these uh, uh, arts uh, things like the orchestra and, and theatre, but the prices are also fairly middle class if you like. You can't go to these, the, the tickets start at about 70 or 80 dollars for a single. So uh, for families it becomes quite expensive. I don't have a simple solution to this, but do you have a simple solution? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think part of it is going, well, do all those families want to come to the orchestra? Some, some would like to, and I think, I mean, setting up passes and, you know, there's, there's some really interesting programs just rolling out in uh, Melbourne at the moment for um, First Nations people. If you identify as First Nations, there's a whole lot of heavily discounted and need free tickets right across um, the arts, and that, that's just gathering momentum at the moment, and I think that kind of, you know, really kind of targeting communities of disadvantage and placing subsidy effectively to give them heavily, heavily discounted or free access to, to all sorts of programs across the arts is, is really important. I think it's also about how we apply subsidy to what we think is important as well. Um, so at the moment there's a huge amount of subsidy going into more traditional kind of Western forms. What are the other kind of art forms we can start investing in and provide access as well? for those diverse, diverse audiences. So I think it's probably not an either or. I think it's probably about um, balancing subsidy, opening up to reflect what is a, a very kind of culturally diverse nation um, and reflecting the art subsidy and supporting the, the um, practitioners to reflect that diversity, which it doesn't at the moment. Katrina, thank you for a wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you. Uh, exceeded my expectations in terms of learning. Um, but I came here tonight, really. I travelled from Victor Harbour. It's a um, very short distance away in terms of distances in South Australia. But I really came along to sort of pick up on your tremendous experience in cities. Um, so the impact you've had is stupendous across Adelaide, Melbourne. Um, and, um, but my concern is how do we, what are your tips and tricks for developing festivals um, and bringing uh, the arts to regional South Australia? Because I'm not, I've watched it in the last few years. Sala, 
which I used to call the Adelaide Living Arts Festival, is now making huge strides in terms of being able to bring its creative people out to, uh, to those um, regional parts of uh, South Australia. But um, it's really critically important, that whole business of building society and uh, growing society that you're talking about, that um, to be able to foster that sort of um, growth and uh, development that, that you've experienced in places like Adelaide and uh, Melbourne and Geelong. Um, so my question simply is, where do you see the development of arts and culture in regional South Australia going and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, think, I think South Australia is really interesting. I mean, as, as I said in my talk, you know, I, the, the experience of working on the, um, the one really sort of um, properly supported regional program that the Adelaide Festival did was that there was a huge, incredibly enthusiastic audience. And not only that, a community that wanted to participate. Um, incredible pride uh, in their own expertise and their, their history, their culture, their produce, their architecture, all of those things. Um, so I, I would encourage uh, the Adelaide Festival to consider an application of subsidy towards that kind of um, broader statewide engagement. I know the Fringe has a pretty significant regional touring program and that's fantastic to hear Sala is doing that. In the end it's it, I, I mean, I suppose the point I'm making in my talk is it's about people who've got the funding deciding to apply it in a different way. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. What, what are your priorities and how do you actually put your money where your mouth is? Um, and today's research, I couldn't believe it when I, I'd already decided to speak on this subject and I opened up The Guardian this morning at 6am on my way here and there's, there's the research saying, well, people aren't doing it. Do it. Um, yeah, I, I, it comes down to money. Um, because it's, it's not, I mean, what, one of the things that I do talk about in Victoria, which I think is here, I don't know how strong it is still, but Country Arts SA, I think, is a really important organisation that um, spreads a network of producers across the state who are engaging with the community continuously. So when, for example, we decided to do a regional program, Country Arts SA was there, ready to go with this amazing kind of network, and we were able to get it up and running in, I think, about eight months. Uh, which was astonishing. Uh, you couldn't do that without someone like the Country Arts SA's um, producers and their expertise. So I think that has been a, a really important um, resource that's available in South Australia. But yeah, I, I think it just comes down to, to choice. Katrina, thank you for a very interesting and Talk. I'm, I do apologise. I'm probably a white, uh, middle-class Australian male. I happen to like orchestra. I happen to like our art galleries. I happen to love opera, and I like our festival theatre. Uh, I went to the Tate Museum in the modern Tate in London with great expectations and was totally disappointed. Went to Trafalgar Square galleries and was amazed with uh, the hundreds of years of things. So that's the background. My question, you've just come from Victoria. From South Australia perspective, I just could not understand what was going on with your lockdowns, which you referred to in your speech and the devastating fact they have. And I still can't understand how you can bid for the Commonwealth Games with a liability of $2 billion <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I mean, your, your, your thing you're building is just a wonderful thing. Everybody criticises things like the Sydney Opera House and things, but they're the things which go down for the centuries. I'd like you to comment on this, uh, uh, give us some understanding of where, why Victoria does what it does uh, in, uh, in terms of COVID, uh, social attitude and the Commonwealth Games and how that will affect the future of arts funding. Hello. Not much in that lot. Well, you know, I've occasionally thought about politics as a career, but <laughs> sensibly I've never gone down that path. So um, I can't really uh, tell you, um, you know, what the kind of motivations are um, from, from, the, um, from 
that political standpoint. Um, but I think, you know, from an arts perspective, you know, this $1.7 billion investment in cultural infrastructure is huge. And the reason it's there is because, A, rightly or wrongly, and I must say as a South Australian, I would twitch every time I heard it when I first moved there, Melbourne is the cultural capital of the nation. That's what it calls itself. And, when it, and it believes it, passionately believes it. And that's what makes it, along with the things like the BCG report saying, well, actually, this, this art stuff's worth a lot to the economy. It's worth a lot to the brand and identity of the state. It's how, it's how the state sees itself. It's worthwhile putting $1.7 billion into this arts area, as opposed to a hospital or a road or whatever they might, whatever, they, whatever else they might, might invest in. So um, I, I think, you know, it, it's interesting, it, you know, each state, I mean, my, the, the three states I've mainly worked in are New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, and they're all quite different in the way that they perceive themselves. But there's no doubt in Victoria, it's a city that is passionate about arts, culture and ideas and conversation, and it's that that has prompted this incredible, uh, extraordinary opportunity that, that this investment allows. I thought that was quite skillful the way I evaded <laughs> answering the bulk of that question. Thanks. Just a really quick question about Fed Square. I really like Melbourne and I've been there a few times and I always go to the galleries. And I love Adelaide. I was born and bred. Um, are they going to do a facelift of Fed Square? Uh, we are not going to do a facelift of Fed Square. Fed Square is a heritage listed uh, architectural environment now. Um, but what we are doing, we've Fed Square's now come into the Melbourne Arts Precinct Corporation, so it was sort of established as this kind of quasi-independent thing. So when it was built in 2000 um, and opened in 2002, it, has, it was set up with an independent board um, as a kind of um, self-generating, self-funding entity with one shareholder that was the treasurer. And so the government kind of owned the asset but had no control of the asset. It had to generate its own revenue whilst meeting its civic and cultural charter and ACME was based there, NGV Australia is based there and then Koori Heritage Trust came in there. So I was a tenant for seven years. And basically what happened is over the 20 years it became older as a built form. It cost a lot more to maintain and suddenly the sums didn't work and all of a sudden this crazy kind of commercial activity started happening until somebody was like, we've got to fix this, let's bring in an Apple flagship store into the square and they were going to demolish one of the buildings. Community outcry, um, the, the flagship store got pulled, it became um, heritage listed and then it was brought into government under this new organisation that I now run. So we've been in charge of it for about a year and we're sort of trying to really refocus it back into that civic and cultural charter trying to allow the kind of um, uh, arts organisations that reside in there to really sing, to allow the architecture to really sing, sort of strip back all the kind of stuff and guff around it. You know, I've got rid of the kind of um, fake lawn that was all over the kind of beautiful Kimberley sandstone, for example, in the plaza. Um, we've just deployed, she just started this week actually, a um, senior producer for community and cultural engagement who will be there solely focused on bringing in kind of marginalised um, communities from across Greater Melbourne to feel ownership and invitation to express themselves, their ideas, their culture in Fed Square. We've just appointed a senior First Nations curator and we're in the market now for a, a, a junior First Nations curator and that will really kind of amplify how we tell First Nations stories and reflect this place that's right on Birrarung in a place of um, ceremony for, you know, millennia. Um, so, again, refocusing subsidy is how we're going to do it. There's no, no big renovation going to happen, but there is going to be a, a, a refocus um, towards that, those kind of really core cultural values. No, you don't go yet. Oh. Um, 
I'd like to ask um, Esmond, uh, who's sitting just over to my right, to uh, propose um, a formal, wonderful, I'm sure it will be, vote of thanks. You might like to sit down while I thank you. <laughs> it's not really going to be that long. <coughs> So on behalf of the Wilkes Committee and everybody attending tonight, it is really my honour to express our thanks to you, Katrina, for your wonderful presentation. Now, as a person with a science background and never having had to give a vote of thanks to a topic about arts being a central fabric of society, I too went to chat GPT. <laughs> <coughs> and I said, write 200 words on a thank you to a presentation on art as the essential fabric of society. And I did it once and I thought, no, you can redo it again, it comes up with another paper, and then it, I did three. And then I constructed a vote of thanks out of it and showed it to my most intimate critic who said, you can't say that. <laughs> Those hyper words, it doesn't sound like you at all. <laughs> so I'm afraid I had to scrap the GPT <laughs> and you're just going to get the homegrown version of my vote of thanks. So, the valuable insights that you have shared not only penetrated our minds tonight, but also touched our hearts, reminding us of the profound impact the arts have on our lives and of the role that the arts play as a catalyst for change in shaping society which seemed to me to be a big point of what you were speaking about. And we're certainly privileged to have had the opportunity to learn from you, your insights. And we thank you for the way you have enriched our understanding about the whole arts enterprise. What I decided to do was to take some notes that I could reflect into the vote of thanks but I've got so many that I've decided that that's a bad idea as well. <laughs> there were so many good points you made that I can't reflect them all back. So what I ended up doing on my notepad was to do a mind map. I put arts in the middle and I thought, now what are all the things that we've heard about? And we've heard about history and culture and different art forms and finances, policies and politics, all very important political people you talk about, by the way, um, your personal involvement, arts administration, and $1.7 billion investment. All of that seemed to me to be leading us down a whole lot of pathways of very interesting things that led to successful ventures in the arts. So, as a homegrown product of South Australia, a champion of the arts, we have been inspired by your enthusiasm, your passion, and your commitment to advancing artistic pursuits. As you have highlighted for us, the arts are not merely an extracurricular activity, but an essential component of a vibrant and flourishing society. And I'm sure that stories are part of the arts. We spoke about that yourself. And if I could just relay just a very short story of something that happened tonight. Just before we came here, we sat to listen to the news. And it was gloomy, depressing, and dark. There was news about somebody, a, a woman with 
small kids being hijacked at knife point and her car stolen. There was news about shootings in New Zealand. There was news about a terrible pedophile in Australia being jailed for 20 years. And it all sounded depressing and dark. But then we came along to hear you speak and the sun came out again. <laughs> so thank you very much for the wonderful presentation you have given us tonight. And as I deliver this gift on your behalf, I would ask you to put your hands together for Katrina and her great presentation. Now remains uh, for me just to wrap the evening up, um, firstly by thanking everyone who's been uh, involved in making this happen. Thank you everyone for coming out on um, a Friday evening, not quite the middle of winter but uh, I think you know what I mean. A few advertisements. On, our seat, on your seats you'll see that the Effective Living Centre is um, actually very busy at the moment and uh, there's a range of things. Seminary of the Third Age coming up in August. Uh, the topic will be First Nations Perspectives on Caring for Country um, and that's with Auntie Denise Champion uh, who's known to many of us. A concert for The Voice at uh, Trinity Sessions on the 27th uh, of August. There's uh, Trinity Sessions, a lot happening there because there's also the Aboriginal artists for The Voice, uh, Sam Gollan, Me, I, We Art Exhibition at uh, Trinity. Then a screening of The Last Daughter with guest speaker Simon Williams, the film's producer. You should have a flyer for that. That's a bit later in August, um, uh, here where we are now. So please, have a look and see what's on uh, with the Effective Living Centre. Take the uh, brochure away and uh, we'd love to see you at uh, some future events. So thank you again Katrina, Claire, everyone who's helped out tonight and for attending. Please, stay for a little while as we have some uh, supper and uh, uh, I wish you well and a safe drive home later. Thank you.